So my name's uh, Fish Krish and I have an extraordinary title at the moment of Head of Special Projects, mm -hmm. which pretty much kind of encompasses whatever anybody wants to throw at me. And I work with a company called Tomorrow's Warriors and we're based in London. And we are a jazz development organization, normally based at the South Bank where we deliver our sessions. Of course, we're not doing that at the moment. We are to be found online. And we were, we are also creative producers and we were touring all the way around the UK. Some of you might have seen us with the jazz ticket and the reggae ticket and Jazz Jamaica All Stars and all these kind of projects. Hopefully we'll be back in May. So do watch out for that. Anyway, uh, that's enough about me, I think. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to do a little uh, intro from everybody so we can uh, find out who these extraordinary women are in front of us. So I'm going to go first to Jilly Jarman, who uh, is the creative director and all round inspiration behind Blue Jam Arts. So Jilly, Hi. tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> okay, so... Um... What I really like is that I'm sitting here in my living room and I'm staring at my screen and staring back at me are uh, four other women who I know and who I've worked with all of them. And in fact, I'm working with um, Jess and Kate at the moment and Therese and I have done stuff together. And um, so that is is really special for me. Uh, so I feel like I'm among friends and um uh, we've already just had a little talk about um, how we are, who we are, where we got to where we are, and oh my gosh, why are we here? Well, how did we get here? So I, when I was little, um, I always wanted to be a composer and I had piano lessons. And um, whenever I tried to write a piece of music, I was used to imagine I was a man. And I never realised that I did that until I was about 30. And I realized that every single piece of music I played for the associated board was written by a man. Every composer I knew was written by a man. And if there's one thing that I want to say about what I do, it's about, it's about um, allowing people to be who they want without thinking that they can only be if they look a certain way or are a certain way. Um, and that's not just about gender or um, heritage or age. It's just about, you know, the sort of person you are. And the, the most exciting thing for me is when I see somebody who does something completely unexpected and um, that you would just wouldn't expect them to do. And I, for me, that is really, really inspiring. So um, my journey to get here up to Cumbria has come through um, a long spell in London, playing with punk bands, uh, playing with jazz bands, playing with Fish in a band called Chaos. Uh, which sort of probably was uh, very descriptive at the time and um, and also then getting into jazz and getting into improvisation and uh, one of the big things for me is that when I started out teaching and going into schools and working with people you couldn't say anything about improvisation it was just off it was just off you know it was off the um, agenda and now it's actually something that people recognize and see the value of. So what I love about my job is that I'm able to do the thing that I've always wanted to do. And now it's kosher and it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I founded Blue Jam when I moved up here uh, in 2002. And I founded it because I was uh, teaching some young people who just weren't getting on with music at school or at school. Uh, they were quite disaffected and I just suddenly thought why am I doing this in, in individual lessons just get everybody together and um, we just had this magical few years where uh, we would go into this big community building that had lots of little rooms and corridors and everybody would go and be making their own music and writing songs and then showing at the end and it's just like I just thought um, this is this is what music's about this is how it happens and then all of a sudden it sort of stopped and what I learned from that was actually the reason why those young people had been able to do that was because I'd been teaching them. And the way that I'd been teaching them was to look at musicianship. So it wasn't just like you're learning to play the piano. It was like, this is music. How does it work? Let's take it to bits. You know, just as if it was a toy train and you're taking it to bits or a computer. And then let's see if we can put it back together again. Or we can make something else out of it. And actually then uh, with that sort of... Um, way into music it sort of takes away an awful lot of things it takes away are you good it takes away 
Do you know how to do certain things? Like, can you read music or have you done exams? Mm -hmm. None of that is important. All that you have to do is to have a little bit of creativity and a little bit of confidence and not be the be the toddler that you know that won't let anybody else play with your bits of music and um and put things together and see what happens and obviously that sounds like lovely but it's also it's a skillful thing to do you need a lot of skills to be able to do that but they're not all musical a lot of them are completely different um they could be about self-defense i mean they could be anything um so i suppose my take on being a creative director is about being creative, being like diagnosing things, um, project planning, um, imagining things. Um, and and that's really because that's what I want to do for myself, um, actually. So I'll just say one last thing, which is that um, I'm going on sabbatical and uh, this is going to happen. I've sort of said this for the last 10 years, but this year it is actually going to happen and I'm going to go away and play. So that's that's me finished. That's wonderful. Actually, it's wonderful news for all of us because I think when you go away and play, you're going to come up with some amazing new pieces and, and uh, go down into the depths of your own uh, own process, which will be incredible. Lots of questions have come up from from what you said there, um, especially you know talking about uh, enabling people to really just express themselves. I'm sure that will be a theme that we'll pick up on, but. Um, Let's go around. So maybe T, if you're up for telling us a bit about what you do and how you got there. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm my name is Therese, but I'm just more commonly known as T. Everyone knows me as T. Um, so I'm a drummer um, and uh, nobody knows this, but I'm also a pianist. <laughs> and um, when the lockdown happened, well, I had a piano uh, for years and it was passed down the family. And unfortunately, um, there's a mansion up near Carlisle and my uh, piano was being stored in this mansion and um, the mansion went up in flames. And so my, my poor piano, um, it had a great end to its life, uh, but that meant I was pianoless. Uh, so during lockdown, um, my really good friend has been writing songs for Eureka Children's Museum and every week I see him playing his piano. Oh, and I was just like, I'm going to get one. So um, I got one during lockdown. I've got it all set up and it's just it's been the best thing about lockdown for me is getting my piano. So I've just been getting back into playing. But my, my main instrument, I would say, is drums. And that's where my profession has come from. Uh, so I play drum kit uh, currently with a band, they're called Horny Funk, and um, it's myself on drum kit and there's two saxes, two trumpets and one sousaphone and we, we play covers from um, bands, uh, there's a band called Lucky Chops um, and there's a Young Blood Brass Band and we, we play their covers and it's brilliant, it's really good fun. So, uh, so that's my, uh, my playing side. Um, in in the year 2000 i was really lucky enough to meet an amazing another amazing woman called Catherine zesserson from the sage gateshead um and um basically cumbria was in the same funding line as the northeast and she said i've got money <laughs> and we said well we've got an idea so that was it was like a perfect marriage of two things coming together and that's when, um, I'm going to talk about them later, but basically we set up a band called Boomdang. And that was in 2000. So Boomdang was always a project and we were always funded uh, through the Sage Gateshead and then later Soundwave, uh, a Cumbrian music organisation. And in 2007, uh, we weren't able to get funded anymore. We had to set up as, a, as our own company. So in 2007, I set up the Boomdang Foundation and it's a company limited by guarantee. And the strands of the Boomdang Foundation are uh, a band called Boomdang, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, we also specialise in, in our own in-house traineeship. Uh, so we really concentrate on workforce development. Uh, we do outreach workshops of all sorts, not just drumming. Um, I basically work with a load of associate artists and we can, do it. we can provide any sort of workshop in any setting for anyone that wants one. Um, and the main project I run at the moment is in partnership with Children's Services and we run music sessions for children in care and uh, we, we as musicians 
go into the residential homes of young people and we write tracks using logic, uh, we create rhythms, uh, we create guitar tracks, we've got a mobile recording studio um, and at the moment uh, that project is being funded by Youth Music and that one is called Beat Loop uh, because we use loads of rhythm beats and uh, loads of loops on Garage Band and Logic. Um, so that's kind of like in a nutshell who I am. And um, like I say, I'm going to talk more about Boomdang as one of my achievements uh, later on in the conversation. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Sound, sounds amazing. Can't wait to hear something. <laughs> um, right, Kate, would you be up for telling us a bit about what you do? And So um, I'm based just south of Penrith and um, I wear broadly three different hats I've decided um uh, because I've done many, many different kinds of roles um since I graduated in 98 um so I'm an artist um and I, I'm a visual artist um I work in what I call an expanded practice so I don't work in, in any particular kind of um medium although I do draw a lot and teach life drawing too um uh, so my art might answer um, an issue or a question or um, a state of being uh, and I'll respond to that in some kind of way um, but I can talk a bit more about that later if you like. Um, so that's one hat. Um, I'm also um, an illustration designer and um, I do lots of freelance work which is kind of design work, um, sort of bread and butter money really, which I enjoy doing because it's drawing based and I love drawing so that's great. Um, and I'm also a project manager, um, an advisor and I've had lots of roles in sort of uh, project management, directorships, leadership development, mentoring, etc. Um, so on one hand I'm an artist, on the other hand I've been a business advisor. So I cover that kind of spectrum, um, which I find really fascinating. And I've realised that actually I, I graduated in 98 from Camberwell in graphics and sculpture, um, which was a real mixed bag and really great fun. And then I went on to do, well I organised the degree show um, and I was quite key, a key member of the team there. And I found myself enjoying that organizing as much as actually the making. Um, so that was a point, I think, where I thought, okay, this is a really interesting dynamic going on here. And then I did an MA in Arts Management. Um, and the reason I did that was because there was a big disparity in the languages between creative people and managers. I thought, well, what's all this about? They just don't get on, you know, what's, what's the issue, where, where are people coming from? And, um, and I guess that fusion um, between the, the two different perspectives I find really fascinating. So I, I guess that's why I have so many different hats. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoy that energy. I like organizing, I like managing, I like the concepts of different management and leadership, um, but then I like to have a break from it and make work. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, it's an interesting one, an interesting dynamic. So I'm at the studio at the moment. Um, it's a, a, an arts and wellness studio. Um, so we do the whole breadth of activity. We have art and music and performance and visual arts. Um, and then we have um, you know, yoga and, and Pilates, but with a sort of wellness thing in mind. So um, lots of different scope for activities there and for people's wellbeing. And we're a community interest company. Um, so any profits go back into the, into the company for the benefit of the community. Um, and this is where my studio is too. And at the moment, during lockdown, it's, it has been my studio. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> but we're opening in two weeks and I'm in the middle of trying to get it a bit cleaner and tidier. <laughs> well, we can't see anything more. It looks very lovely from where we're looking. So do you actually run the studio as well? Is that yes. part yeah. of your, one of your yeah. house? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm very keen to for us all to look at the whole thing of, of juggling. It's not usually put on the... Uh, on the job description, but I'd say it's essential, yeah. essential feature, juggle, good juggling required. It's an interesting <laughs> area. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kate. I look forward to hearing more. So Jess, over to you. Hello. Um, so I am a freelance creative project manager. So I work with lots of creative directors to make their ideas happen. Mm -hmm. And so I started off by founding my own charity called Ingenium when I graduated because there was no jobs in the arts out there. So, and I really, really wanted to keep creating. So I made my own and I just, yeah, went for it. Decided that other people would be in the same position as me wanting to create, but not being able to connect. I was living in London at the time 
Um, so founded the organization which was called Ingenium and I worked there for about eight years and I've just about a year ago stepped away and let it kind of flourish on its own. Um, I run a, um, I'm like Kate, I've got lots of hats, I run a, a poetry organization called Growing Poetry as well and we're all about um, using words to kind of grow community and um, get people to meet each other and play with creative ideas and um, that everyone is a writer and everyone can write which is really nice. Um, but I've, I've been lucky, I moved to Cumbria Penrith about a year ago now and I've been lucky to work at the studio Moreland and Jilly at Blue Jam. And so yeah, it's been really nice to watch other people's process and be able to um, yeah, learn how other creative directors do do this thing. Great, well you'll be well well placed to, to carry on this, this conversation. Um, because I think that's something that we'd really like to look at really is how we, how you all balance out the different roles of being creative having your own creative practice and also managing a company or, or um, being a creative director of a company and you know, encouraging other people to inspiring other people so uh, I think if that sounds good to you we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more and yes I was just going to say Jilly is demonstrating <laughs> our <laughs> protocol which is the hand will go up when someone is going to ask a question Chilly. <laughs> yes, I did what I was told. I, yeah. I, was told. <laughs> I meant to tell everybody that's what we were doing. Don't interrupt. Just put your hand up if you're going to there say you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I, right. So in Blue Jam, uh, we started off in 2002, and it's only been probably really in the last couple of years that um, we've had more of a team that's been running running it. Otherwise, I've sort of been doing it really on my own, and. Um, that means that they do everything and do the accounts sort of clean the building um you know sort of get all the funding and you know take people here there and everywhere and you know just just do everything and actually i love it i just i just love the fact that you you just find out how to do it so i built the website so um i learned how to um you know i learned how to do code and um then, then also we made films, so I learned how to use a camera. So then we made and and to use Premiere Pro, and uh, you know, so basically whatever you're doing, oh, we'll have a recording studio. Okay, learn how to use Logic, um, and um, and basically I think that's a really nice thing to do. And as a woman as well, I've really uh, felt that that was important not to uh, sort of fall into what I feel is a really annoying stereotype. And I really get annoyed when people stereotype me that because I'm an older woman, they just assume that I won't be tech savvy and I won't know what I'm doing. And actually I sometimes don't know what I'm doing, but a lot of the time I know enough to get on with and um, to make things happen. And um, it's so been amazing to have someone like Jess coming and work with us, who's also just really, really good. And you say, oh, do this, she's here, I'll find out how to do it. If I don't know how to do it, I'll find out how to do it. And I think that that being a creative director um, and in all of us are in organizations that have loads of delivery happening with very, very little back backroom support. Do you know what I mean? None of us have got like teams behind us making it happen for us. We have to do everything. And actually that gives us an awful lot of choice that we can, we can like meet somebody on the street and they can say, oh, I really always wanted to do that. So we think, okay, we'll make it happen. Let's set up a workshop and do it tomorrow, you know? Um, and you can do that. Whereas if you're part of a really big organization, you often don't have that facility to be able to be, to be responsive. So often you'll get money to do some big project. By the time you've got all the money, all the young people that you wanted to work with, they've got exams. So they're not there <laughs> and you've got all this money and you've got like two people and, uh, being able to use the money that you get really effectively and wisely means that you've got to be on the ball, responsive, grassroots, knowing who you're, you know, just being really irritating person that people they see in the supermarket and they turn around and walk away because they know you're going to ask them to do something, you know, um, just have to do that as a creative director. That's what I'd say. But I, I just want to jump in with a question here, though. That, that's an amazing picture of you just managing everything on all different levels. Then how do you manage the thing when of actually empowering others to do things as well? Because it's do you see that as a tension when you know how to do everything so well yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking for personal experience. <laughs> I mean, maybe 
and somebody else might want to jump in with that. You know, when you when you have got a lot of skills and you're used to really sorting it all out, probably at quite a speed. It's it's very yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's very it's very easy. Uh, yeah, when you when you you have to. I'm quite similar to Jilly in that I'm at the helm of my own ship and I do exactly the same. And it's sometimes quite difficult to get volunteers on board. So you know, for the music nights, for example, that's a Saturday night. So you come in and set up and do the gig and then you're the one left at midnight cleaning the toilet you know but that's kind of all part of the game isn't it really um but um so in terms of empowering others and and, and being so used to juggling the balls all yourself sometimes it is a bit difficult to let go because you know you can just go and do it really quickly um you know i went and bought the lino today for the new the loo and i'll probably go and put it down tomorrow and just get on with it whereas sometimes it feels like trying to do you know the roundabout thing to get people on board to help is it's a lot more long-winded um but it's also about letting go isn't it Julie? Well, well yes and I, I just wanted to say that um I am learning how to do that I'm learning how to let go and uh I've got a great team now um mm -hmm. and they're ignoring me which is absolutely brilliant and exactly how it should be um but I just wanted to say like I did um a training session with, which T ran uh and I just suddenly thought like you know what that approach that T has where you're sort of like you lay things out you set things out everybody knows where they are and what's going to happen next um and and I know that there is there is two sides to what I do one of which is being able to sort of move around what's there can make some people feel quite nervous because they don't quite know what's going on and it may other people feel yes this is what i want because i'm not going to be pigeonholed and i think it's i think it's being able to sort of walk somewhere in the middle but i t i just was so impressed with what you did and your team and how and how everybody just has their has something has the space to say something you know can you tell us a bit about that t because it sounds like you've got quite a different sort of approach in a way well, that came about because, um, so in this project that, uh, that we're running with Children's Services, um, there was a, a section of it that was about sharing our practice with other organi similar organisations. So in the other universe, we would go, uh, we'd say we would have gone up to Penrith and we'd have been in the lovely space that Julie provided, we'd have all their instruments and uh, we would have been face to face with people and we'd say, right, this is what, we do it like this because of this and then we do this but because the, and we always have reasons and for our methods so uh when lockdown happened i spoke to youth music and we just juggled the budget a little bit and we created an online sharing of practice session and it lasts one hour and we've gone on tour with it so that's a positive that was one of the positives that i was going to talk about later on but basically uh in my project, there's two project leaders, me being one of them, and my colleague Phil, and then I've got three trainees, Demo, Will, and Kane. And uh, within my project, uh, in the other universe, we would have met once a month uh, for four hours, and it would be a hands-on, making music together, devising new uh, sessions, uh, with me and Phil being present, uh, and we'd be the lead artist but we'd always be handing over to our trainees so with on with creating online we did exactly the same approach and uh i i just uh i basically like do a lot of nurturing and enabling and so i didn't want the session to be me and phil because we're the project leaders i wanted it to be me and phil and the trainees playing an equal role so if you wouldn't even know they were trainees so we worked a lot with them on like delivery and uh, we all worked together to create the various sessions uh, that we all ran for Jilly. So we ran five different aspects. Each one of us did, um, did one of those aspects, but we must have worked for about six weeks, really perfecting them. Uh, so, uh, so now the, tra the trainees are, they're just, they've just excelled so much because we're meeting them every week. And that would be a positive I'll talk about later on when, when we talk about that. You, you can talk about it now if you like, actually. We don't have to go. <laughs> if you, okay. If you talk about the positives of what you're doing, why not? 
Uh, so it was to do with, uh, I would say that was the real positive that I thought has come out of lockdown is the fact that I have um, been able to really work with my uh, trainees and me and Bryony had a little chat at the start when when because I was a little bit early for the meeting um, and um, if we're not running a session with an organization uh, I I task them all with uh, we still we do you know if you do a zoom meeting you've got to do a quiz <laughs> always so um, our we meet every Wednesday at two o'clock till three and if we're not working with another organization then each of us will run a, sec a section of the quiz. And, uh, you know, the positives that I see coming out of that is about developing their presenting skills, is developing their confidence, um, it, the clarity on how they're uh, getting the information across. Um, so it's not just a quiz for me, it's about, uh, there's lots of other elements that I know that's happening with, with the, the team of people. If that's yeah, <laughs> no, it sounds it sounds it sounds brilliant. So basically, that, that's how you you've got that very particular style of of actually really encouraging other people and training them as well uh, around yeah. around a project. I'd say that's uh, it's a style of leadership that I've always had, whether being in bands. So uh, like you would never know I was the leader. Um, I'm never one to stand out in front or, or or try and stand out. What I try and do is just have everyone is sort of like equal, um, if that makes sense. So even when I'm running music stuff, um, I would never stand out in the front. I'd always like be be in part with the participants um, and leading from leading from that way rather than at the front. And I try and do that with uh, my trainees at the moment. Uh, so we're all sort of like equal when we're running sessions. Interesting. So, Jess, is what would you say would be your style? Are you sort of somewhere in between? Yeah, um, I, I think um, with the stepping back and letting other people lead thing, a lot of it is about trust. And I knew when I wanted to give up my charity, it was good that I had people that I'd kind of nurtured along the way and let them have their do their own thing because they they what they were doing was often amazing. And to say, yeah, have my group, I've set this up, they do art, do what, what you'd like with them, is unusual for when you're just starting out in um, in doing this leadership stuff. And to let people make their own mistakes is is quite nice. And people have to be able to make the mistakes in order to get better. It's quite difficult as a director um, to let go of that control. But um, when I did it, it was, it was really quite freeing. And I, I'm the same as T, I quite like to lead, but not in front of everybody. Like, I like to uh, manage and then make it happen and, if, and then it all happens in front of you and it's, it's lovely in that way. Um, but um, stepping away from my organisation was another different experience. Um, and I think organisations, you know when they need somebody new at the helm and my organisation and Genium had got to that point. Um, so having those people who are learning all the way through is really, really useful so that um, you have other people who are really passionate about what you do, so they can they can take the helm when um, the organisation needs it as well. I, I just want to comment on that because I, I actually don't think that's a very easy process, and I think that it's a huge credit to all of you that you're able to do that. To be honest, because I think it's very easy to become extremely attached to the kind of yeah. identity of what you're doing, the the quality, the you know all those things, and that process of actually allowing others to to run with it to make their own mistakes is not easy kate i'm just going to put the light on because i seem to be going into the darkness here yeah, i'm back <laughs> hey. um, no i totally uh, um just taking what jess and tia just said absolutely and um it's all sometimes well, it's about empowering people isn't it? And, it and it's about creating an environment um and Kind of facilitating an environment and, and making a space for people to allow people to feel safe and trusted you know and trustworthy um and relaxed enough to be able to explore um i cheat a bit um by using the building because um part of the reason i took on this building I'll, i can show you around if you like um is because when i every time i came through the door it it, it felt like the building held you it just felt like a safe space and um We've always had the mantra of um, the, you know, it would be a place 
um, a safe space for creative exploration. So I, I, I kind of use that and, and it's so, it's absolutely lovely when you see people come through the door who haven't been here before and they might be um, a group of children with learning difficulties or young carers or um, people who haven't drawn before um, who, who come to a drawing session and they come through and go, oh, what a nice space. And then automatically sort of kind of get into the whole relaxed atmosphere of it and then are able to express themselves um, through whatever the activity is. And it's, and it's not always me that's running those sessions, I have to say, and um, we've got a lovely bunch of practitioners and, and leaders who actually run the sessions. Um, but it's incredible to witness it, the transformation of people when they come through the door and because it's quite scary going into an unknown venue, you know, and you can't back out. It's a kind of a one way thing. Um, so with, we're opening um, in a couple of weeks um, an exhibition which is coming up. And what we're actually going to do is we've got a back door onto a croquet lawn and gardens. Um, so we're going to, instead of being that environment that you go into and it's quite scary, we've said to people, it's a through flow um, and you can enter and then go out the back and it's quite a safe um, thing to be able to experience. So hopefully um, it'll bring people through the door who might not have gone in across the threshold before. So it's for us, it's about environment as much as mm. uh, leadership. So, yeah. Excellent. Julie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to bring in this whole thing because um, I think this is a it's a real nugget, isn't it? It's a real sort of point that you need to sort out and you need to make it work. And I think that one of the things I'm really proud of is how many people in Blue Jam, one, are going on and they're, they're using music as their, I, as either something that they really enjoy or for a lot of them as they're living. Actually, we have an awful lot of young people who are now signed artists or they're in bands or they're composers, they're recording um, and all, all they're teaching. Uh, and I mean, I would say probably about 50. I mean, I, because I was at Soulfest a few years ago and um, I realized that there were 35 performers at Soulfest. This is our a local Cumbrian festival who were either participants in Blue Jam, had been participants in Blue Jam or were Blue Jam tutors. And a lot of them were playing about four or five bands. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting at the moment is that actually a lot of the projects that we run now are being run by people who grew up in Blue Jam. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, I, it has been quite haphazard in a way, the training, but what we have done throughout uh, the whole of Blue Jam is we've, we've done a lot of week long work experience um, uh, placements for young people who are in secondary school. And uh, also we've, we've run a lot of projects where we've had a young person as a young music leader who've sort of shadowed the leader and then gradually sort of often <laughs> taken over. So our samba band is run by um, somebody who grew up in Blue Jam, became a young music leader, is our youngest director on the board and is a fa fabulous drummer. And the band is just, well, T will know. <laughs> I'll name him Josh. You know, he's just a really, really, really exciting young leader and, um, and is just taking the band from strength to strength. And also uh, we have Tom Worker and Bryony Mike, who's also my daughter, um, who are on the Blue Jam team uh, there. And they are um, actually probably going to take over a lot of the work when I, on my sabbatical. And because of lockdown, Tom's in Manchester and Brian is in London, but they are delivering uh, online so that they can actually uh, do a lot more work rather than having to come up and deliver. And so because people have grown up in Blue Jam, they've sort of, they sort of, they're sort of they're steeped in the process really but what I like is that they're just taking it over they're just moving on they're adding stuff that I don't know about and they're and a lot of the stuff that they that they know that I don't know is that they are they seem to be very very confident about moving into the next step so after you've been in education what and college or whatever what do you do then so they're negotiating the music industry in a way that I feel is actually really good and a lot of our other young people are too there's something when I was doing it I had little tape in cassettes with my <laughs> band uh, sort of going around record companies you know just absolutely no way nothing happened uh, so just I completely failed about doing anything uh, like that and so it's wonderful that that they are able to do that and they will be able to help our young people do that as well 
Well, I think it's just as well you failed at that, really, Jenny, because you wouldn't have gone and set up this extraordinary kind of rolling creative family that you've <laughs> that has pulled in so many other people. It's got such a legacy. So actually, yes, um, I, I I I agree, and it's sort of like I love this. I love it, and I'd like to play a little clip of music now. And um, people listening to it, they might not think like, "What on earth is that?" Just sounds like. I, I, they can't make head or tail of it. Um, and what I'd like you to imagine is that there is a young person for whom music is a real way for them to express a lot of difficult emotions. And there is myself. And I also use music in that way. But in my role as teacher, I'm not doing that because I, you know, because I'm, I'm the sort of the blank wall in a way but also very very responsive and responding to what they're doing so you've got two pianos and you've got somebody who doesn't play piano but is so so um when I say don't play piano they haven't like done exams or grades or anything but they are so musical and that they just put me to shame with what they do you know just the, <laughs> their alertness and the way that they respond and it's just like one of the most delightful things that I've ever done so I think uh, we're going to hear a clip of this now it's very very short right inspiring isn't it and that's about 40 seconds of, of a piece of music that i recorded that went on for probably about 50 minutes which is an amazing amount of time for someone in primary school and yes the primary school to just sort of have that level of sort of focus and concentration and um, so for me that is that improvisation you know just just play and something happens something changes something moves mm. Wonderful. Well, maybe it's a good opportunity now to just uh, hear from other people what, some of their sort of um, favoured moments, their, their achievements or things you might have overcome and then what do you achieve from that? Has anybody got anything they'd like to tell us about? T, if you've got something over there. <laughs> Um, so uh, I'm going to we're going to uh, see a little uh, 42 minute uh, clip, um, and but first of all I'll introduce the clip. So um, when we were chatting earlier before we went uh, live, we, it was about uh, what our, our what we think is our greatest achievement. I mean, I've, there's loads, but this one is just very close to my heart. So um, it's my band. It's called Boomdang. It's been go it was set up in the year 2000. So we're now in 2020. And when we set out, we did loads of recruitment all around the schools in Barrow and Dalton. Uh, we made all the drums ourselves. So they're, they're, uh, they're exclusive to, they're called boom dang drums because you play them on their side. They've got a bass skin and a high skin. It's like boom dang. Um, so it's based on the Indian doll drum. Uh, within the, the drum sizes, there's a 24 inch sub bass. 20 uh, bass, 16 inch uh, tenor drum, and then we've got like a snare. So basically it's all our original music. We make it, we compose it ourselves and it's looking at melody lines created by, we've got seven skins. So um, that band started in 2000 and in 2020, we have still uh, got in that band, the same members that started in the year 2000. So within that band now, there's been marriages, divorces, there's been babies, uh, but uh, we've stuck together for 20 years. So this year was our 20th anniversary um, and I pulled all the stops out and we had a great year of touring. Um, but obviously locked, everything ended. Uh, which is a real shame because it was like the biggest gigs we've got, like loads of festivals and stuff. But well, we can do it all next year. They'll still be there next year. So uh, I know during lockdown, every band uh, was doing that thing of, you know, making that video wasn't it? with all the little squares and everyone playing their little instruments. But the thing for us was all our drums 
are still in storage and nobody could get to the drums. So we couldn't do what all the bands did and play all our instruments. So we had to improvise and we improvised using uh, coffee tins. Uh, I made a drum out of my coffee mate tin. So we just covered it with paper and drew on the lines like the roping of the drums. Um, and uh, we, we played a bit of a joke on everyone because we made it, we did an illusion. So the drums looked massive um, and looked like we were playing real drums. And then we all step away from, and the drums are like ridiculously tiny. <laughs> So that was our lockdown video, and I think, Bryony, this might be the time to play that video. Did anybody else guess that? I, <laughs> you hadn't told me the secret. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, really great. Um, so I think maybe it, it might be a good moment to sort of start looking towards the future. I mean, you, you, two of you have described these, these uh, families, really, that you've created. I mean, I can't believe that you've been going with the same band for 20 years. I mean, that's, that's the Guinness Book of Records stuff, I'd say. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's the question of succession, how you, how you move things on, which we've touched a bit, but also, what would you say to anybody now who's listening to, listening to all these amazing stories and thinking, actually, yeah, you know, I, I'd like to be able to do this. I'd like to get involved. I'd like to be able to do my own creative practice, to run my own company. Yeah, Jess. Um, so when I started, I knew nothing at all about, um, I knew a bit about the creative arts, but I didn't know anything about setting up a charity. I didn't know anything about finding money or anything like that. But I had an idea. And I think as long as you have an idea and something you want to do, you should just run with it. And you can learn about the, the funding stuff and the, the charity organization governance and all that sort of stuff later. Um, but it takes, it just takes you sitting down and wanting to do something and going in, I don't know, if you wanted to work in an older people's home, why not contact them, ask them? And most will be quite, apart from now when it's COVID, but they might put you up on a screen and, you know, um, and you just kind of have to try things and see what sticks and see what the community around you wants as well. Um, and talk to people, talk to other people who are doing this and see what they want to do. But definitely, if you've got an idea, just start it and see what happens. Um, you can wait until you know everything and go on all sorts of training. But um, but the best thing is just to kind of get going, in my opinion. Kate. And following on from that, believe in yourself. Um, and especially when someone that, you know, someone comes along and says, you can't do that or don't do that or that won't work, you know, I think it just that belief in yourself, you know, and I think if you want to do something enough, um, I think you, you will, you know, but I think there's a certain, there's a leap of faith, isn't there? You've just got to go for it, but it, you have to have, have some kind of um, uh, belief that you can do that thing. Julie? I think, um, in a way, the economic situation obviously makes it very difficult for musicians and artists at the moment, um, especially since so many people have missed out on any of the um, support from the government because they haven't fitted into one of those categories. Um, but I think there's always been an issue, if you're a musician, it's very, very difficult to earn your, your living from performing. Um, and actually what a lot of people do is they end up working in cafes uh, because that that sort of that sort of job can be can be you can it's usually fairly flexible so you could spend quite a lot of time um sort of doing doing the work that you don't really want to do in order to be able to do the work that you do and it, we, used to, we used to always laugh when i was in london it was that if there was any 
musicians that had really nice, really nice um, gear. It was probably because they were actually doctors and they were <laughs> playing in their spare time. You know, it's all the all the musicians who were sort of trying to like do it full time. So, like, we're trying to carry their drum kit on the bus, you know, and um, you know, it's sort of like so what do you do? So a lot of people then they teach. Now, the thing is that you might then go and teach in a school because that's probably one of the only places as a teacher that you can get a, a, a proper salary and, you know, get a good remuneration for what you do. But then if you do go and work in a school, then what often happens is that that starts to take over and then you become like a school teacher. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, so long as you haven't just slid into it sort of without really intending to um so actually setting up your own company and thinking about how within that company you might do things that you enjoy that also mean that you carry on practicing doing what you're doing so at the moment i'm doing these jazz online sessions and uh, they're really really good fun uh and i have to like uh research the piece that i'm going to do and i get to play the piano and i get to sing and i get to improvise and basically i'm sort of moving on my skill while while passing that on to other people so I think you it may be that you actually another string to your bow is that you're really good at stage management okay so you could have that role within a company that you set up or it could be that you're a good recording engineer or maybe that you want to set up um, as some of our young people are your own um, you know record label or whatever so I think that um being a it's much easier nowadays to set up a company than it used to be they've made it a lot easier you don't have to be a charity you so you only have to do one set of accounts um and there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there that can help you and if you don't have a lot of overheads like if you don't have a payroll and if you don't have a building it's not so scary mm -hmm. really you know so you sort to of keep your activity within the means of what what you might be able to bring enough money in to support. And Kate, do you find the similar thing uh, as an artist? Do you find that you can balance out, uh, just picking up from what Jilly was saying, you know, your own artwork and the demands of the company? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it can be total chaos and a nightmare. I did a 60 hour week last week and I'm furloughed from one job. So um, <laughs> it's it, it's like uh, for me it's like bosses, but it, yeah. So I I'll have at the moment I've got a lot of design work on at the moment, which I've had well the last sort of six to twelve months of design work, and then um, a, a great art project that I'm working on as well. So they've taken over a lot of time, but still obviously running the program and 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 doing other things too. So it's been quite stretched. And then how it's a, it's for me it's not an easy one to manage because. I still haven't learned to say no. <laughs> I'm getting there, um, and I and I and I get such a buzz out of you know doing those different projects. Uh, so it really is spinning plates, and it and I and I do crash actually. Um, I do have cycles where I just go, oh, I can't cope. Um, so yeah, it's not an easy one to manage. But then you know th there are times when it's not so busy, and there's just one or two projects going on, which isn't much more manageable and and whatever. But yeah. I, I kind of just have to go with the ebbs and flows of, of how that how that is. And that's just kind of how it is, I think. And I, I, I kind of quite like it. Life would be so boring. I couldn't, I couldn't just imagine having one job. <laughs> Are you spotting young people who, I mean, uh, I know you've already said you've got, you know, Bernie and, and, and a good team coming up in Blue Jam, but are the rest of you spotting enough young people who are ready to do the 60 hour a week endless juggling, not clear idea of where, you know, where the fight and the money's coming in and when it's coming and how it's coming. Um, you know, do you... A little bit. Um, I mean, we're, we're quite sort of rurally based. I mean, we're, it's, it's like a kind of different demographic, I think, to, to, to the possibly to the other organisations, but um, there are loads of opportunities if people want to get involved. <laughs> You know, there, there are, there's, there are so many, I would happily take anyone under my wing if they wanted to get involved and you come and take over. <laughs> but are you finding the people? That's the other way around. Are, are there are amazing um, but are you finding I mean, No, I, it would be nice if there were a few more around for me. How about you, T? 
Um, I, th uh, I mean, I've just got the team uh, I work with. Um, I, I haven't got the, uh, I'm not as big as Jilly's organization, so I haven't got like the same infrastructure, but I'm, I'm very envious of uh, Blue Jam Arts and I'm always inspired by Blue Jam Arts. So I'm always kind of like, looking at them and enjoying what they do. And I just think we're just that little bit smaller. Um, so I've got the team of people that I work with um, who also do lots of other freelance jobs. So I'm just, so the one that they do with me is that's what they do with me. And then they work with theater companies and like other jobs and proper jobs. And so um, at the moment, I probably haven't got like a Bryony or, you know, or a, a Josh um but I've, we've just we've got the people that we work with and that feels really comfortable right now with the size of my company so uh, another question like thinking about the um the times that we've just been well we're going through still we're not through it <laughs> the whole sort of covid scenario and uh what changes you've had to go through and in particular most of you, I think, are solo artists, and I imagine that uh, COVID will have brought about, you know, quite a lot of um, isolation and perhaps less support than usual. And I wondered how that's made you feel personally, you know, managing through this these times. Chili, <laughs> I've spoken to a lot of people. Um mainly I'm talking about other 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 people who do things like me, and this enforced pause has actually been, I mean, it's been challenging, but it's also been incredibly useful in terms of we've had to stop. We've just had to stop. And, and we've just gone, oh, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, so blimey, was I really doing all that all the time? You know, spinning plates constantly, constantly, constantly. And, um, and, and and actually some of us have started doing our own work, you know, doing more stuff for ourselves or we started rethinking what we're doing, how our organizations work, what we want to get out of it. Maybe there can be a change of direction, what's good about what we do. So that sort of pause for reflection, I think has been one of the good things about COVID. Obviously there are loads of awful things mm. and one of the really good things has been this reflection and actually um i feel that um this whole thing about when the world is in such a parlous state and what do you do you write music and you just think like oh god can i really justify that's what i do and i've uh, just read some really good quotes which i can't remember of course now but actually yes that's what you need to do. If that's what you do, that's what you need to do. And you need to keep doing it and make sure that you do it as much as possible right now, because that is your response. And survival is about making art and art can look around the, car the corner with clear eyes. You know, it enables you to see things, to hear things in different ways, make connections with people. So I just feel like yes it's really important to keep going but also to take that space to evaluate what's important what isn't have you all found the same jess how's it been for you i guess um there was a lot of pressure to make things work right at the beginning being people who facilitate creative things to happen we had to think really really quickly about how we're going to make it work how we're going to reach people how we're going to get the money in how are we going to you know continue building those communities that we've worked so hard to get together um so i know that a lot of people that i've worked with found that beginning bit at least really really frantic and we're not quite at the stage yet where we've been able to have that time to think about our own practice because we're so busy kind of sorting out other people's practice um and it is a balancing act definitely but i think that's almost a strength of creative organizations that we can be in this situation and produce so many things um, that other people can do and be creative themselves so even though um probably with my stuff that i'm doing i've not been able to pause and write beautiful poetry i've been able to help other people to write and create their own things so in a way that's my practice too and if this isn't a time where i'm going to be writing stuff that's okay 
um, now everyone reacts differently, I guess, to to these these circumstances. Yes, I, I was going to mention that a, a, a musician friend I was chatting to was saying that actually she found it a very uncreative time that mm -hmm. it had had a completely opposite effect, which I think in itself must be quite difficult to manage because of the way Jilly was describing it. You'd almost think, yes, hooray, we've got space and you know, the world's not knocking on our door and we can create. But what if you can't? <laughs> I didn't feel like that at all. No, Part, I didn't feel like that at all, I, partly because I was too busy and wanted to have time off, <laughs> wanted to have that pause and couldn't. Um, but no, I, I, I it, for the fight or flight thing, it made me just pause completely um, for a number of weeks. And um, but yeah, it was a very much emotional roller coaster, wasn't it? Really, I think for a lot of people. But um, but then after a few weeks, the later half, um, it became more apparent how we could help people. Mm. Uh, I, and I think. Um, and what what role we could play um, in helping people uh, locally in the local community. So we've played this yellow box of delights. Um, and I think, <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's it's not an original idea. I think a, a number of organisations around the country have been doing similar creative packs. But we've created. Um, Jess has been a one. I have to say on this one, she's been <laughs> super project management there. Um, really brought it together. Uh, we brought a grit box basically. Um, and uh, we're making two editions, one for July and one for August. And there are packs for families and younger people and packs for older people. Um, and they're creative um, activities and, and activities for well-being as well. Um, and they've flown out, basically. I think people have really enjoyed them. And I think particularly um, for people who are not on, on the internet or who have had internet overwhelm. Um, I mean, the internet went crazy, didn't it? And lots of things online and, oh, we'll have this. And it really made me, uh, from a director's point of view, not want to do lots of um, workshops online because there's so many about and they're done so well. So I'd rather share something that's been done really well rather than, you know, try and replicate it um, somehow. But we have put our practitioners online, uh, which has been good. Um, and try to support our practitioners as best as possible. But the, the yellow box has been lovely, a lovely thing to do. It looks lovely, it looks wonderful. We're coming towards the end. So I just wanted to remind anybody listening, if you've got any questions that you want to ask any of these amazing uh, creative people here, then please do just uh, send them through. Um, I, I was going to, I don't want to be a downer, but I was just wondering <laughs> how you're all viewing this very uncertain future. Um, I mean, you've described wonderfully how you've dealt with the actual current, the crisis that we've just been through, but we're still looking at such an uncertain future, particularly from performance point of view. And I just wondered how, how you're feeling about it, what your thoughts are. Anybody? <laughs> Well, as a, as a venue, um, it's really uncertain. We've got some funding until March um, and past that we haven't. So if it continues, we might well close. That's just black and white. Yes. Chilly. So uh, we also have a building in the middle of Penrith and uh, obviously we've not been having any rent coming in. I mean, any <laughs> money coming in to pay the rent. Um, but I think we're going to be okay. Um, and... Uh, we're just repurposing it basically. So um, instead of doing things with big groups, uh, we're gradually getting people coming in and people are actually coming in to use it for their online sessions as well, which I think is hilarious. Um, so, um, and we're creating a garden out the back. Uh, so hopefully we might be able to do something outside as well. Um, Yes, but that, that is the hardest thing, is to have something where you have to pay rent every every week. We have a very understanding landlady, so I'm hope, you know, obviously it, she can't be understanding forever, but I think she really wants us to stay, so that's amazing. Well, I mean, if anybody can get through all of, all of this, I mean, creative minds can definitely do it, can't they? We'll definitely be devising new ways. Um, I think I've come to the end of all my questions. I don't know if anybody else has got anything that they would really like to say before we, we finish up um, that we haven't said. Uh, I would like to, oh yeah, T, go ahead. I just want to 
to say, I made a, uh, it's just made me giggle. I made a little list about, um, it was when we were talking about um, the balance of a freelancer and then being a, and being and a facilitator for others. And it was a list I wrote down at the very start. I'll just read it out to you. Yeah. Uh, lots of organizing of people, uh, uh, sending out dates to people, jiggling dates with people, <laughs> uh, bookkeeping, uh, that's something I had to learn. Invoicing, paying. You're also a counsellor. You're an auntie. Uh, there's lots of loading and unloading. Uh, and that was my that was the list I wrote at the very start. I just thought I'd like to get that out because it's like a job description. <laughs> Absolutely, it all sounds very very familiar. And you can, I'm sure there's there's many more things we could add to that. Yeah. So I hope there'll be plenty. Sorry, say, Julie. Uh, the other thing is that it can be very lonely um, heading up an organisation, um, yeah. and because you're, you, 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 it all lands on you. I mean, as Kate says, when everyone's gone, you're the one locking up and <laughs> putting things away, and and uh, and actually, things like networks like this that we have here, yeah. we learn from each other, yeah. and um, just just taking part in this webinar is really useful just to hear everybody we're sort of saying the same thing but we're expressing it in different ways yeah. and uh, and that's just really useful and i just like to flag up something that jess um sort of has has put together as a collaboration between growing poetry and blue jam and it's called finding space in silence and um this is quite i love it because this is this is a poetry project but it's also part of our music offer mm -hmm. and it's sort of like silence so but you do music and the whole thing is it's like to do music you need to start from silence so you need to have somewhere to start to do that and i just feel like whether it's silence or any any other thing it's like what we do as facilitators is we try to as in kate's place you're offering a safe environment tea you're offering a sort of a framework that people can fit into mm -hmm. um so it's sort of like you offer something where people can walk in and once they walk in that door or that virtual space they are a creative person and there is something that they can do there to express themselves mm -hmm. and to share their ideas with other people and and that's what for me what it's all about yeah well I think I don't know if it's something about the northwest, <laughs> the, the kind of communities that you're living in, but I can definitely it feels to me from reflecting from from down here. That's you, you've got much more, obviously, much more space and much more creative space to to create to have those kind of settings. I think they're so much harder. Those kind of ungoal orientated settings are so much harder to uh, to to really achieve in, in London or to create in London. I think uh, we, we definitely are much more goal orientated here. I don't know. Uh, That's interesting. I'd quite like to take that conversation forward another time. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to leave on an... Uh, on the well, that's, that's the next... Uh, that'll be webinar number 17. Yeah. <laughs> I guess actually it's quite interesting the way that the way that location and environment mm affects your ability i was looking at what you're doing kate and obviously so much of what you do is is very inspired by the environment and um, the the whole kind of mood and gentleness of, of, of the, is a reflection of having time and space i mean as opposed to a kind of more urban environment yeah it's something really interesting to explore we're very lucky we're very lucky <laughs> Well, I'll have to come up and have a look around. I've been, <laughs> still not made it up, have I, Julie? <laughs> now you're going on sabbatical. Oh dear. Well, we wish you well, honestly. Um, it will be a, it, it, very exciting to see where you get to, both in reality and in your creative practice. So uh, I think it's time to wind up. And thank you all so much. And thanks for inviting me to take part. Actually, it's been wonderful to um, to meet you all and to hear about what you're doing. And I'm going to hand over to Julie to give you all the final sort of taglines for where to, <laughs> where to find out more. Yes. So um, if you want to see this or <laughs> you've seen it already, but if you, if you want to see any of the other webinars that, and future ones, they'll be happening every Wednesday at this time. The next next week is being um, organised by our Blue Jam Youth Jazz Group. So uh, it's called How to Get a Gig. 
and um, that sounds like it's going to be really exciting. Um, you can find all of all of these webinars on the bluejamarts.org. So it's .org, bluejamarts.org. Uh, if you go to um, online learning, you'll find the webinars there. And you'll also find um, all the re resources for my online jazz sessions. You'll also find videos that we've been making, which are jazz teaching videos and some of the work songwriting we've been doing with our young people. So there's a lot on the website, but you can find you can find anything that we're putting online there. Is that is that it, Jess? Have I got it all right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, Fish, very much. Thanks a lot, everybody. It's lovely to meet you all.